we welcome you to Easter 2020. You know, this very well could be the most unusual Easter that we will ever know in our lifetime. Yes, we're going to miss the energy, the excitement, the enthusiasm. We're going to miss the fellowship of worshiping together. But what we will not be denied is this opportunity to honor our Lord and Savior. We will not be denied the opportunity to declare our faith and trust in our risen Lord. And so this morning, as we begin, would you allow me to read the resurrection story from the Gospel of Matthew 28, uh, beginning with verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. It goes without saying that the resurrection is the single greatest event in human history. It's the foundation of our eternal hope of salvation. It's the proof that God is able to save us from our sin and deliver us to his home in heaven. It is the very bedrock of our faith. It's the fabric of our personal relationship with God. When it comes to a discussion on resurrection, there is no better place in Scripture to turn to than the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And so I invite you there to join me. Let's see what Paul has to say about the resurrection of Jesus. Picking up in verse 3 of chapter 15, Paul says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And we want to be sure that we know first off that that Paul said this is of primary importance. This is the most important element of our salvation confidence. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He also kind of refers repeatedly throughout this chapter to the Scriptures and how everything was done in accordance with the Scriptures. We remind ourselves this morning that, uh, that Jesus predicted, even during his lifetime, he told his disciples what was going to happen, how he was going to die, be delivered over to, to sinful men, how they were going to crucify him. But then again on the third day, how he would rise from the dead. And even going back into the Old Testament, there are many prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Prophecies that he fulfilled to the letter completely and totally. And so when Paul refers to these events as happening in accordance to the Scriptures, it adds that much more weight, that much more veracity, because it's exactly the way the Old Testament said it would happen. After this uh, connection with the Old Testament, he then begins to list uh, the long number of eyewitnesses that saw him after the resurrection. And he picks up in verse 5 with Cephas, or Peter, first, And then he says, and then he appeared to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. An eyewitness body of over 500 people, Paul says, most of them still alive today. You don't want to take my word for it? Go ahead. Go find them. Ask them to tell you their story. They saw Jesus before he died. They heard him teach. Many of them would have seen his miracles. They watched him on the cross. At least some of them, if not most all of them, witnessed his death on the cross. Probably some were still there when he was taken down from the cross. Some of these eyewitnesses were literally involved in wrapping the body 
of Jesus to prepare it for burial. They knew he was dead. They had seen it. They had experienced it. They knew that he was no longer breathing. They knew that his body was no longer warm. They were eyewitnesses to all of these events. And now they were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Some of them touched Jesus. Some of them ate food with Jesus. Some of them were with Jesus when he said, touch my, touch my uh, body to see I'm not a ghost. I am resurrected. This body of eyewitnesses lends to this account a level of authenticity that, that can't be made up or fabricated. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on in verse 7 to talk to some others that had been appeared to. He says, then he appeared to James. And we would note that most likely this is a reference to his half-brother James. And it's really important to remember that Jesus' brothers before this event, before the resurrection, did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They did not believe that he was, son, was the Son of God. So there was no family connection that gave him the benefit of the doubt. This appearance to James could very well be speaking of the time when Jesus appeared to his half-brother and they had a conversation. And that appearance led James to the place of saving faith. He changed his mind. He went from a non-believer to a true believer. And then after James, he appeared to all the apostles. And then Paul says, last of all, he appeared to me. So somewhere in the vicinity of 513 or 14 or 15 people specifically were appeared to by the Lord Jesus Christ over the period of 40 days after his resurrection, before his ascension, to verify, to prove, to give irrefutable evidence that he truly had come back from the dead, that his father had brought him back to life, resurrected him from the grave, just as he said it would happen. You know, but I love the fact that Paul in the middle of this discussion on the resurrection, he stops and, and he takes a minute to talk to those who still do not believe. He talks to those who just simply would say that resurrection is impossible or that the story of the resurrection is just a fairy tale. It's, a, it's just a belief that, that's a crutch for those who need help getting through life. Paul speaks to them. Because he now enters into, for just a short paragraph, kind of a hypothetical situ situation, a, a what if, a what if scenario. Listen to these verses. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And all of those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Do you follow his logic? And unbelievers would say, well, that's exactly right. That's what we've been saying all along. Your faith is empty. Your faith has no value. Your faith means nothing after you die. And all it really is, is just a help. It's just something you can lean on during your lifetime. Everybody, Paul says, who's died up to this point, Without Christ, they, they died in Christ, trusting that Christ was who he said he was and that his death meant something and that he truly rose from the dead. All of those people, Paul said, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, they're lost. They're doomed. They're already eternally separated from God. And by inference, those who will die from this point forward are still in the same boat. And then Paul makes this incredible statement. And he just says this, if in Christ we have hope, only in this life, we are of all people the most to be pitied. If our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the uh, resurrected Son of God is not true, then Paul says, you know what? Out of all the people in the world, we are the most to be pitied. It's really important for those who maybe are on the fence 
They're doubting. They're not sure. Resurrection is such a, a crazy idea because we've never seen it happen. Um, they're just um, unsure that they will ever be able to believe in this resurrection story. You know, it's, it's just really important that we make a statement here. Undermining our belief, our trust, our faith in Jesus, in a sense, if you will, pulling us into the boat with you doesn't improve your situation at all. All it really does is just highlight the fact that if what we've trusted in is not true, then we are no better off than those of you who do not trust and who not, do not believe. And together we would say, you know what? Of everybody in the world, we would all be those who should be pitied because we're lost. We have no hope. Whatever belief system we're kind of trusting in, and everybody has some belief system, whatever it is we're hoping in is not going to be enough to ever bring us into the presence of God. So I love the fact that Paul is honest and that he identifies with those who are still not believing by reminding them of the situation that we would all be involved in if this account, historical account of Jesus' resurrection was not true. But I love the next verse where he says simply this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. In fact, historical, verifiable, proven fact. By just what we looked at, the fulfillment of prophecies, the prediction in Scripture, the way that every single prophecy ever predicted about Jesus was fulfilled to the letter and exactly, completely, perfectly true. And then beyond all of that, over 500 eyewitnesses who could stand up and give testimony to the fact I don't know how it happened. We've never seen it before. But all I can tell you is this. The man that I knew is Jesus was killed on a cross. He was placed in a tomb. And I have talked to him on the other side of that tomb. He is alive. And that really is the, the hope of the Christian faith. That is the bedrock of our belief. But you know, those who do not believe still see this as just a huge question mark. I mean, for those of us that believe, this makes sense. We have come to the place where we believe. We've accepted the eyewitness account, the evidence presented in defense of the resurrection of Jesus. We've accepted it. We have claimed it as true. We've been convinced. But for many others, they do not have that confidence. To them, it's just a bedtime story that we tell our children to make them feel good. Well, there were many in Jesus' day who didn't believe. I've already mentioned James who didn't believe, but there was one other who just gives to us a great example of someone who had seen all of the evidence. He had heard all of the accounts and he just flatly refused to believe. His account is in the Gospel of John and it's in chapter 20. His name is Thomas. And yes, he is the original doubting Thomas. He was one of the 12, which means he walked with Jesus, he watched Jesus, he listened to Jesus for over three years. He knew what Jesus said he was going to do. He had the opportunity to hear it explained many times, and he saw many miracles to kind of authenticate the message that Jesus was teaching. And yet, listen to what happens when Jesus has been placed in the grave and Thomas, for the first time, hears that he was resurrected. Well, on the evening of that day, and that's the resurrection day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said to them, Shalom, peace be with you. And when they heard him say this, he showed them his hands in his side and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now, that's an understatement. You think they were glad? They were overjoyed. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, hey, we've seen the Lord. Listen to Thomas's response. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and I place my finger into the mark of the nails, and I place my hand into his side, I will never believe. You see, Thomas was just one of those who said, I won't believe it 
until I see it with my own eyes. Well, God was gracious to Thomas because a week later, eight days later, his disciples were inside again. Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were locked, the, Jesus came and stood among them and once again said, Shalom, peace be with you. Then, and can you just imagine this? Then the Lord turns to Thomas. Thomas, come here. Holds out his hands and he says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas's response, and I would just imagine as he fell down on his knees before the Lord, he cried out, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas is maybe someone that you can identify with. Thomas had all the evidence. He heard all the stories. He saw all the miracles. But when it came to that final hurdle of believing that a resurrection had happened, he just couldn't bring himself to believe. And so the Lord appeared to him, called him by name, and said, Thomas, believe. Believe. Maybe you're like Thomas, and maybe you are either unable or unwilling to believe unless you see it with your own eyes. Can I just tell you that in the same way that God revealed himself to Thomas, the Lord is willing to meet you. He is willing to reveal himself to you. He is willing to open your eyes to see and to believe. He, he's willing to meet you at your place of unbelief and to help you believe. You know, where do you go? to see him? Where do you go to meet him? Where do you go to find that place of belief? Well, you go to God's word. You know, the very next verse after the verses that I just finished reading go on to say this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Ask God to show himself to you. Ask God to answer your unbelief. Ask God to help you believe. And then go to God's words. Read God's love letters to you. Go to the Gospel of John, this very book that we've been reading. And starting at just the beginning, read through the account of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what he said. Watch what he does. Observe the, the interaction with people and their response to him. Look at his compassion for those that didn't trust him. Look at the way that he continually presented himself to them as the son of God, offering them hope, offering them deliverance from their sin, offering them a way to heaven, a way to be for all of eternity in the very presence of God. In a sense, put Jesus on the stand. Ask him questions. Ask him to, to show you, to answer your questions, to give you faith. And as you do that, I, I just promise you, God will never refuse a prayer for faith from those who genuinely and sincerely seek him. It's his delight to answer that prayer. It's his delight to open your eyes and to help you to understand. Our prayer is that in reading the Gospel of John, that you will come to that place where, just like it says there, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow in Your presence to thank You for the fact that the, the grave could not keep Jesus and that He conquered death not only for himself, but for us. And we're told that as the first installment of the, those that, uh, that will be resurrected from the dead, that he is our promise. He is our guarantee that we too will be resurrected from the dead. 
Father, we thank you as we celebrate this Easter morning. We thank you for the deliverance that we find in Jesus, the hope that we find in him. We thank you for his love and his mercy and his compassion on us, that while we were yet sinners, lost and unable to save ourselves, he came to die for us. He came to take our place, to bear the penalty of our sin. He came to ransom us and to deliver us safely into the kingdom of God. Father, I pray for all those who believe this morning that your blessing would rest on them, that today would be an exciting day as we just reflect on what is ours because of what Jesus accomplished for us. But I pray especially for those who do not yet believe. I ask, Father, that they would take the challenge that they would ask you to show yourself to them. Lord, I ask that you would call them by name, that you would reveal yourself to them in a powerful way. Lord, I ask that as they read your word, maybe even the Gospel of John, that you would show them what they need to see to convince them that what Jesus said he would do, he did. And who he said he was, he truly was. Lord, I pray that you would grant them faith that would lead them to repentance and salvation. And Lord, I ask that you would bring glory to your name as you do it. All across the country, all around the world, on this Easter morning, Lord, I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be lifted high, that his story would be told with boldness, that the Spirit of God would move in a powerful way, and that there would be thousands who would come to know Christ as their Savior. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us. Thank you for interceding for us even now as you sit at the right hand of the Father. Lord, thank you for the promise that for those who will place their faith and trust in you, that you will give to them eternal life. Please continue to accomplish your will in the days ahead. And we will thank you and we'll praise you for it all, Lord, as we celebrate you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed a prayer this morning to believe, to ask Jesus to be your Savior, would you let us know? Or if you're still wondering, if you still have questions, just contact us. We would love the opportunity to talk with you and to walk with you along this journey of faith. We'll do the best we can to answer your questions. We'll encourage you the best we can. We promise to pray for you. And our desire is that one day you too will have the confidence that Thomas had when he saw the Lord, that you'll be able to say through eyes of faith, my Lord and my God. May God bless you in the days ahead. Thank you so much for being with us today.